first, I want to give you a little story about some patients, a population in tremendous need, and then how we deconstruct these patients to figure out the best way that we might develop new therapies for them. For that, we had to build a whole new department at MIT, the Department of Biological Engineering. And then once we deconstruct them, we take samples from these patients and bring them back to the lab and build avatars of the patients to develop new therapies. And so let me take you back first. Uh, for me, 1997-98 academic year was an, amazing, was an amazing year. It was the year I got tenure. Things that I was working on, bone tissue engineering, using 3D printing, was actually moving into the clinic as product in collaboration with an orthopedic surgeon and a company I helped start. I married my best friend. We helped start a new department. Everything was great. Except that year, I also had IVF, and I failed. And I failed miserably so bad, Brigham and Women's threw me out of their program and told me not to come back. You never get over infertility. The maternal instinct is a force of nature. And it's, it's very, very hard to even think about it, even standing here and, and talking about it. But when you're at MIT, you can do something about it. And uh, the backstory um, on my infertility was that ever since I started having my menstrual periods, they were terrible. Pain, bleeding, fainting, vomiting, horrible GI symptoms. Started in high school. I was an athlete, karate, track team, everything. Things got worse in college. I had to get Demerol shots every month at the infirmary. Worse in graduate school still. Rescheduled my qualifying exam. Finally, when I moved to MIT for a postdoc, I went to the doctor every month for six months. They finally scheduled me for an outpatient procedure, said I'd need a couple of days off from work. They weren't sure what was wrong with me. No one ever said that anything that happened to me was abnormal. They all said that I was within the range of normal symptoms. I didn't even wake up from surgery until the next day. It wasn't outpatient. I was in the hospital a week. And they told me I had stage four of a disease I had never heard of, endometriosis. This is a disease characterized by ectopic growth or growth outside of the uterus, of the lining of the uterus. So if these little lesions form, they become filled with blood vessels all over the place. They can go in the diaphragm and tunnel through to the lungs, invade into the bowel, into the kidney. You can lose your kidney from this. I almost did. And so all of these things happen and they cause terrible pain, anemia, and it's the leading cause of infertility in women. We really don't yet completely understand what causes it. There's a lot of theories. It could be a developmental problem. It could be that in some women, when they have their period, the menses goes out the fallopian tubes and implants in the abdominal cavity. And, and we also know that some women do respond to hormone therapies, but I wouldn't be here talking to you today if there weren't an enormous number of hundreds of million, uh, uh, about 100 million women around the world who are suffering so much that they have repeated surgeries over and over again, 10 or 12 surgeries sometimes. Okay, so I, you know, didn't want it, didn't think I would ever do research in this. Um, but some things happened in around 2006, 2007, 2008 that changed my mind. One of them was these endless calls from my sister who lives in Atlanta um, about her daughter who exactly had the same high school experience with me with respect to her periods. She also loved math. And, you know, the doctor would tell my sister, you know, she's uh, kind of exaggerating. She got sent for tests. She had a lot of GI symptoms. Colonoscopy came back negative. And the doctor told my sister, your daughter is making everything up to get out of going to school. Okay, this wasn't that long ago. Lava shot out of my head. My doctor, Keith Isaacson, got her referred to a great surgeon in Atlanta, and she had stage 3 endometriosis when she was 16. Okay, so uh, Dr. Isaacson said, are you ready to do research on endometriosis now? Because around that time, I also had my eighth surgery for endometriosis, which was after I'd had a hysterectomy. And so, you know, it's like, not for MIT. I don't want to talk about this at MIT. I don't want to think about it. Not for MIT. But then also around that time, um, another thing happened at MIT. Susan Whitehead, who's on the MIT Corporation and a very wonderful person, devotes enormous time to MIT, invited me to do a women's event at the Museum of Science, a lunch. And in preparation for it, she, she wanted the speakers um, to think about how their research influenced women. You know, what, what, what does it really have to do with women? And I'm like, I work on liver and bone, nothing particularly with women. I was actually kind of a little bit irritated by that. But then I started thinking, MIT is a place that everybody looks at, and they watch how you spend your time. A lot of people can work on bone. 
Uh, but not that many people can actually work on real things, tangible things that will help these 10% of women who have this disease. One in 10 women has it. So a student asked me a question at the end of this uh, session, and I blurted out. The student said, where do you see your lab in three to five years? I said, I'm going to have a lab that focuses on endometriosis research. What the heck? Where did that come from? And moreover, what am I going to do? Because there was no money. People thought I was crazy to think about this. You go from well-funded research areas into something where there's no funding. So Dr. Isaacs and I looked around. We got a foundation to give us a quite big grant. We recruited postdocs, and we started the Center for Gynepathology Research together between Newton Wellesley and MIT with Doug Laufenberger, my collaborator at Systems Biology, also um, my husband. And the question, though, was, what are we going to do? I didn't know anything about this field. Doug didn't know. Keith is a clinician. He's a sur great surgeon. But the biology, we didn't know so much. But then a miracle happened. I got breast cancer. And it was amazing. I found a lump in my breast in Singapore on a Friday. By the next Friday, I knew that I was something called triple negative breast cancer. Now, that's not a particularly good kind. You have supersized chemo, but what it means is that I was negative for three canonical markers, molecular markers related to the mechanism, the prognosis, and the therapy. Okay, so there's targeted therapies for many kinds of cancer. There weren't any for mine, but I did fine with regular chemo, and here I am. But it really got us thinking. Um, it got us thinking about, in endometriosis, there's nothing like this. You have endometriosis or you don't. And I can tell you, my oncologist didn't come up to me and say, Linda, your tumor is three centimeters. Here's what we're going to do. But that's what they were doing with endometriosis. It was classified according to lesion burden. You get points for every lesion you have, and your stage four, if you've got a whole bunch. And it didn't really mean anything. It didn't correlate with symptoms or anything. Um, so what we came in and said is there's got to be molecular subtypes of this disease. There's got to be. Okay, how do we find them? There's so much heterogeneity, the age of onset, the clinical presentations, everything. And in fact, um, you know, what we've ultimately done from work I'll show you in a moment is we have changed the field to appreciate this. I went to a conference uh, about five years ago and there was a banner saying exactly this, endometriosis is not one disease. So I felt, yay, I'm not alone anymore. People finally, finally got the message. So what did we do? Um, well, again, we were very fortunate that back in 97, 98, we had started a new department at MIT. It was actually an experiment at first, became a department later, now course 20, called biological engineering. Now, what does that mean? Well, at the time, we had biomedical engineering. You probably heard of that, engineering applied to medicine. So that green thing there is a laser. That's Megan Loring, who was a, actually a fellow who helped operate on me once. And she's using a laser to excise some of the lesions, OK? And so medical engineering, where you bring all this kind of cool stuff to do surgery and tools and widgets, is very, very well established. But wasn't, what wasn't so much established, and what we really needed was to be thinking about molecular biology from molecular up to systems level. How is information being processed in cells? How do things change in space and time? I'm showing a cell here getting cues from the environment. They could be um, protein signaling molecules, nutrients, etc. They process through signal transduction, and then they make decisions about what to do to grow, to divide, to secrete something. Thing. Cell decision processes was popularized by Doug Laufenberger. Okay, and so engineers see not just a molecule and get fascinated with it, they think about categories and functions of molecules and how do they work together to affect the whole system behavior. And we build mathematical models of how these things work so that we can try to predict and understand biology and harness biology, not just understand it, but actually harness it to do things we want, and even not just in medicine, but in agriculture and other things. Okay, and, and so we claim we started a new discipline. This has actually been um, accepted in the community. Um, MIT won a big award from the National Academy of Engineering last year for creating a new discipline of biological engineering. So it's like chemical engineering, biological engineering, electrical engineering, et cetera, for really a biology-based um, discipline. So now why was this important? It's important because when we go in and think about how we're going to understand endometriosis, it's not genetic. So in cancer, you have mutations 
mutations of genes, and you can do sequencing and understand things at the level of, ah, there's a mutation, there must be something related to that. But in diseases like endometriosis and some other chronic inflammatory diseases, it's probably changes at the protein communication network state. So we can look at how cells are talking to each other and infer what the whole network is doing. How is the network messed up? Okay, so what did we do in a first study that got a lot of attention eventually in, in order to do this? So we had about 100 patients and controls together. Now, if you had cancer, you'd have 1,000, but we didn't have that kind of money. And they had all stages of disease. And we took the peritoneal fluid, the fluid that exists in your abdominal cavity that has proteins and cells in it, very easy to collect. And people had published that there was inflammation, but they focused on a single molecule or maybe two or three. What we decided to do was actually measure 50 different signaling molecules. It was actually very hard to do at the time. This was about 10 years ago, do it quantitatively. And then we did a kind of analysis that, um, you know, so we take the fluid out, we measure all this stuff, and we did a kind of math that Netflix uses to tell you what movies to watch, as long as Netflix is still in business. Um, and uh, so, so what it means, so it's unsupervised, meaning we didn't tell it who was a patient and who was a control. We still had a hypothesis, a hypothesis about immune communication, but it was unsupervised. And we asked, are there groups of patients in whom these cytokines are changing together, up and down together? in correlated ways, because if they're correlated, that's part of a network. So in fact, we found a signature uh, set of cytokines, and we reproduced this study with a collaborator in Brazil that was there in about a third of the patients with all stages of disease. Using some bioinformatics tools and published databases, we could reverse engineer this, okay? It was pretty tricky, but we then pointed to a particular kind of cell called a macrophage in the patient's abdominal cavities, making all these inflammatory molecules. And it turns out there was an enzyme inside the cell, something called June kinase, regulating all of that. And we predicted that again from some bioinformatics. And, and so when we inhibited that, we could stop the production of this. Oh my God, a non-hormone target for endometriosis. This is huge, okay, so this is huge. Moreover, at the same time, we did a study on the invasion processes. So I'm, we first told you about inflammation, taking the fluid out, something you can teach surgeons all over the world to do, and we have. But we also did a very complex study to look at the process of how these cells invade into muscle. And so I'm showing you here a patient of our collaborator in Brazil. She had these two huge lesions invade her bowel wall, and she couldn't poop. So they took out 10 centimeters of her bowel. Okay, so this is a very serious disease. Now, June kinase also was implicated there. So we got really excited. After we published our papers, we found out that June kinase had actually cured multiple patient populations of endometriosis. Okay, unfortunately, none were human. Um, Moreover, Steve Palmer, the Palmer of uh, the author here, was working at Merck, and he uh, had been pushing this to go into the clinic, and in fact, there was a clinical trial, it wasn't successful, but there was issues with the patient trial design, there were issues with the molecule they used, et cetera, and then drug companies said, you know what we need? We really need models of the patients. We need avatars of actual patients to test these drugs, or we're not gonna take a non-hormone hormonal therapy. So I got a big, huge DARPA grant, about $35 million over five years, and our program manager let us use part of it to build some models. And this is where we are now. This is now supported by NIH. But what you see here is a collaboration with Roger Cam, a colleague, where he has been able to sh grow little blood vessels in a microfluidic device, and you can see the green cells there are immune cells moving through them. And what we're doing now, as shown on the right, is putting little lesions, cells that come from patients into these, and watching the blood vessels grow in, and then we will be doing um, drug treatments of these and looking at immune cell trafficking and so on. So this is really building a very complex model of the patient in the lab, and this is where we are right now. Of course, the clinical scene continues to evolve. Um, what is now becoming a lot more recognized, not as much as it should, is that there's a companion form of endometriosis when it's actually in the wall of the uterus called adenomyosis. Um, it's very understudied. Probably 10% of women have this. You can see here, using PubMed citations as a proxy for research intensity, um, 
a whole lot, uh, not a whole lot there compared to Crohn's, which has similar incidents. So we have a long way to go, but MIT is very committed to being a leader in bringing together engineering and biology and clinicians to solve this. So I want to end by saying um, I never regret it for a minute going in this field, even though it's a struggle for money, because the clinical universe is amazing all over the world. Clinicians are so dedicated to helping women. It is a joy to work with them, and we work with clinicians all over the world. And of course, MIT is a village that jumps up to help when they see an intractable problem. Everybody on the top are people who are funded to work with us, but the rest of the folks here are donating their time. When they find out that this is a problem, everybody knows somebody with endometriosis, and so they chip in to help, and so I'm very grateful to my colleagues. And I'll stop there, and I encourage you to contact us through our website or even just email me if you want to learn more.